Okay, so this lecture is going to be on exploitation. Well, um, I'm going to break it down for you first. We're going to talk about complex interactions, exploitation and abundance, dynamics. We're talking about some models including Lotka Volterra, our favorite. We'll then talk about how refuges affect these exploitation dynamics, including prey density and the ecology of fear. That sounds like a good title for a book right there. Um, and then we'll talk about ratio dependent models. So let's start off with defining what exploitation is. Now, you know what this is, you just ha maybe haven't ha heard it phrased like this. It's an interaction between populations that enhances fitness of one indi individual while reducing the fitness of the exploited individual. So a positive minus um, where one individual is po positively benefits and the other one negatively benefits. So predators are one type of predator-prey relationships are one type of exploitation. Uh, predators kill and consume the other organism. It's dead. It can no longer reproduce or survive. Parasites. They live on the host tissue and reduce the host fitness but do not generally kill the host. So um, here's an example of a tick embedded within a deer. A parasitoid is an insect that uh, leaves its eggs or larvae in a host and then they will consume that host. So it's kind of like a, a mix between predators and parasites because they do kill and consume it, um, but they also act as a parasite for some time where they just kind of live on it. Pathogens then are those that induce a disease and this can be fatal or, or not. Um, and so we have viruses and bacteria which um, and fungi which can cause um, pathogenic diseases. All right, so com there are very complex interactions which can affect the behavior of their hosts. So example is um, a parasite um, in the called the spring-headed worm, acanthocephalans which changes the behavior of amphipods. So amphipods are little um, uh, crustaceans that live on land. Um, and what happens is when they are infected is they will swim towards light. Okay, so this is an aquatic amphipod. Sorry, I said on land. Um, and the water that has light on it is usually shallow and thus closer to predators. And then the predators will eat the amphipods and then the amphipods will um, you know, have some sort of infection that will uh, infect the predator and then the predator will, will pass it along through its life cycle as well. So similar to this is a um, this cycle of this bird and this other terrestrial isopods. This is why I was getting them mixed up. So you have an adult female, um, Plagior hynchus, which lays eggs um, within the intestines of the infected bird. So its feces then have this um, pathogen within it. Um, and that pathogen can then affect these terrestrial isopods. They will eat the feces and then the eggs will hatch within the isopod, causing it to go towards the light or wander out in the open, and then it will get eaten and the process will complete itself and continue. So this is where an infection affects the behavior of uh, a, a parasite and its host. Um, another kind of complex interaction is exploitation uh, with competition. So Park found the presence absence of a protozoan parasite, Adeline triboli, so a parasite that influences competition between different species of tribolium, which are flower be beetles. So Adelina lives a, as an intercellular parasite in the tribolium castanium, but not on the tri tribolium confuse them. So when you put them together, um, castanum usually outcompetes the other, but when you have the intracellular parasite, it reduces um, castanum's, castanium's ability to outcompete the other, and confuse them becomes a stronger competitor.
Okay, so now moving on to exploitation and abundance. So, um, how a an organism exploits its resources as a predator can also affect how abundant it is. So, for an example of this is this herbivorous stream insect and its algal food. So, Lamberta and Resch studied the influence of influence of caddisfly Helicopsyche borealis on algal and bacterial pop populations on which it feeds. At some times, they found that this larva can make up 25% of the biomass of all benthic animals. So benthic animals are ones that kind of cling to rocks and stay towards the bottom of these streams. Um, which suggests that they are such in such great abundance that they also could reduce their own food supply just by increasing in population by, by so much. So they are exploiting this resource at a very um, aggressive pace, which will cause them to overshoot their carrying capacity or even come really close to it to the point where that they may even cause mass fluctuations in their um, population sizes. Uh, another study which showed kind of a similar thing uh, between bats, birds, and herbivory. This is an example of kind of a top-down control, really the control of prey species by predators. So Kalka et al. looked at birds and bats and how they affected herbivorous arthropods. Okay, so treatments included controls, so where they had birds and bats excluded during the daytime and bats excluded at night. And what they found was, compared to controls, bird exclusion increased arthropods by 65%. So here, these birds and their predation is having a great effect on the population of those arthropods. Bats, on the other hand, ex excluded um, or not having bats in a population increased arthropod density by 150%. Okay, now this is relative to control, so this is not necessarily to say that bats are are more efficient than birds, um, but compared to their controls, they were eating, they were controlling that population, which was emerging by 150%. All right, so dynamics. Dynamics are fun because you're talking about how different populations work and are connected. And the classic example of this is the abundance of snowshoe hares and their predators, specifically the lynx. Okay, uh, lynx canadensis is the lynx, and the snowshoe hares are Lepus americanus. So throughout the 1800s and early 1900s there was an extensive trapping records taken of both hares and lynx um, and they showed to be very connected uh, and there were a couple of schools of thought elton proposed that the abundance cycles were driven by variation in solar radiation solar radiation so really a bottom-up control so the amount of sunlight um, caused the growth of plants the growth of plants caused um, herbivory by um, the uh, snowshoe hares, and then that affected the population of the lynx. Um, on the other th thought was um, suggested by Keith that you have overpopulation. Really, the decimation by disease and parasitism because of overpopulation caused a decrease in hare populations, which caused a decrease in lynx population. Um, there was also physiological stress at high density and starvation due to reduced feed. So these are all again <clears throat> kind of these bottom up control that the population of the hares was controlled by these other factors and that in turn controlled the population of the lynx. Uh, when they looked at it, um, the snowshoe hares live in boreal forests forest dominated by conifers. They have these spruce and uh, pine trees. Um, and there's a dense growth of understory of shrubs. And in winter, they browse on these buds and stems of these shrubs and these saplings, these very smaller um, vegetative 
um, plants, not the big trees. Um, and they found that one population reduced food biomass from 530 kilograms per hectare to 160. So they can just mow through this stuff. Um, uh, and then also the shoots produced after heavy browsing can increase levels of plant chemical defense. So in response to this heavy browsing, um, the, the chemical defenses will reduce the amount that's available, and this would affect the populations. However, there, are other, there is other thought that it was a top-down control. So the lynx, which are specializing on these snowshoe hares, um, are then dependent on the hare population, and so their their predation would cause the decrease in population. And predation can account for 60 to 98 percent of mortality during these peak densities. So when it's really high, um, predation is also really high. So you're getting lots of links in response to lots of hares. Well, um, it seems though that both of these things are complementary. That hair populations increase, causing food supplies to decrease, so they are overshooting their carrying capacity. And then that starvation and weight loss may lead to an increased predation. So if you are stressed out, if there are so many of you, then it's much easier to catch, and thus these links um, are going to catch them and decrease hair populations. All right, so when this is all plotted out uh, in laboratory models, we have adjustments to our Lotka Volterra. So Lotka Volterra assumes host population grows exponentially and population size is limited by parasites, pathogens, and predators. Okay, so one variation of this um, is this equation where RHNH is the exponential growth by the host population, which is opposed by the rate of parasitism and predation, okay, this little p, times the number of hosts and the number of parasites and predators. Okay, so our exponential growth of our host then is kept in check by the parasites or the predators um, preventing them from growing. All right, so Lotka Volterra also assumes that parasite predator growth rate is determined by a rate of conversion of food into offspring. So looking then at the predator, um, it can only eat so fast. And we talked about this before um, with our, our models that, you know, our type 1, type 2, and type 3 functional response. If there's a large handling time, then they can't increase in, as a population as quickly. So mathematically that looks like this where CPNHNP is the conversion rate of hosts into perisher predator offspring. Okay, C then is that conversion factor or really the uh, amount of time uh, or amount of effort that is required to eat the prey. The P then is the rate of parasitism um, or predation. So the conversion factor times the parasitism or predation times uh, the populations minus um, our other uh, variables. Okay, and the other variables are the parasite predator deaths. So when they die then you reduce the amount of predation. All right, so when you model this over time, you have an exponential growth by the host opposed by exploitation, right? A predator or prey um, decreasing that ability to increase. Host reproduction immediately translates into destruction by a predator that increases predation that equals more predators. More predators means a higher exploitation rate. Larger predator population eventually reduces the host population, in turn reducing the predator population. And this then has a reciprocal effect. So having more predators reduces the amount of prey 
reducing the amount of prey reduces the amount of predators. Reducing, reducing the amount of predators causes more prey to be abundant, and then they basically follow each other in this lag. And that creates this reciprocal effect where you have this cycle going um, constantly in a circle. All right, so there were some actual real life examples of this in the laboratory. Uh, Utida found reciprocal interactions in adzuki bean weevils. So here's a weevil over here. Where am I? There we are. Here's the weevils looking at uh, eating those adzuki beans um, over several generations. And Gauss also found a similar pattern in these uh, paramecium. Most laboratory experiments, however, um, were epic fails because they just led to the extinction of one or the other. So the paramecium would overexploit the the prey, the bacteria, or whatever it ate, um, and then cause extinction to itself. But there was something in the model that you could add that would cause it to be successful, and that is a refuge, okay, an area where the prey can go to hide from the predator. So to persist for both predator and prey, to, so to prevent predator from overexploiting and killing themselves and to prevent the prey from being overexploited and dying, you have ref refuges. So Gauss attempted to produce population cycles with um, P. caudatum and Didinium nasutum and didinium quickly consumed all the paramecium and then went extinct and then both populations went extinct okay so that looked like this over time the predator ate all the prey and then it died same over here um, but when he added a refuge a few paramecium survived after the didinium extinction Huffaker studied six spotted mite populations and predatory mite populations. So the predatory mite would eat the six spotted mite. And he separated them by these oranges and rubber balls with partial barriers to mite dispersal. Okay, so I'm going to show you the picture. Okay, so the mites could go kind of in between the smaller mites and the predatory mites could go and, you know, travel around and eat all these little mites as they went into the big spaces. Okay, and that was somewhat effective, but when he put on little small wooden posts on the top of the oranges, that served as a launching pad so that the smaller ones could balloon. They could kind of go over to different areas and escape their predator. And when they added this, they found the dynamic that they were looking for where the predator and prey populations were very connected. So some of the refuges that large animals have are protection in numbers. Okay, so living in a in a large group provides a refuge, such as these buffalo. A buffalo all by itself can easily become prey to a wolf, but in a large group s surrounded by all, all sorts of other buffalo, it prevents wolves from eating them. So predators' response to increase prey density equals the prey consumed. Uh, per predator times the predators per area. So that's going to give you the prey consumed per area. Many species employ predator satiation defense. So by producing lots of prey at once, the predators can only eat so much of you, and so it will um, allow a lot of them to survive. So periodical cicadas will do this. Once every few years, they will all emerge at once and over um, saturate the ability of predators to eat them. Um, acorns are also an example of this where they will produce this large mast of acorns in the fall. The squirrels can't eat enough of them. And so they will go and they will hide some of them. And those, when they do that, it causes them to, they, they don't eat them all over the winter and some of them will grow. All right, so another interesting thing, which we mentioned before, is the ecology of fear. So Ripple and Betcha have documented that alterations in prey behavior 
broadly referred to the ecology of fear. So some an example of this is the reintroduction of gray wolves into Yellowstone National Park uh, starts to change the dynamics of the forest, including elk avoiding these open areas where they could easily get picked off by um, wolves. Okay, so elk would avoid uh, meadows, they would avoid these um, areas next to the water, and that allowed a lot of these um, riparian trees, especially willows, to grow and thus help maintain the stability of the forest next or the riparian areas. All right, so a few more Latka Volterra models, and we aren't gonna, we're just gonna mention these. We probably won't go over these very intensely in class. So, an alternative model for trophic ecologies was following a model by Halling, which is the rate at which prey are consumed by a predator, G, depends on A, the searching efficiency, H, the handling time, and N, the abundance. So, this is something we had already kind of talked about. So, our searching efficiency times the abundance of the prey over 1 plus the um, searching efficiency times the handling time times the abundance of the prey. Um, that subtracted from the prey which are consumed by the predator times the abundance of the prey. And then Ardidi and Ginsburg proposed that predator interactions also play a, ray, a, a, a role in the model such that it got more complicated. But basically, A now refers to the rate at which prey become available to predators. So this is getting more and more complex, but basically you have to um, include these things such as... Um, searching efficiency, handling time, and abundance of the prey, um, and its ability, um, the rate at which prey are consumed by a predator, and include all those in the model. So what, if, what RDT and Ginsburg then examined was the study of a predaceous snail and its prey, which was a barnacle. Um, and when they, you, they just plotted the prey population density um, as a function of the prey eaten per day, it just kind of looks like a linear relationship or not much relationship at all. But when you included a ratio of prey to predators, um, it was much more abundant that there was a saturation point that at a certain point, uh, predators could not eat any more prey per day somewhere around 60, 40 to 60, where it didn't matter if you increased more and more prey, um, the, the predators could only eat so many, around five. All right, so one last application to this, uh, the value of pest control by bats. Uh, an area in southeast southwest Texas has an area of 10,000 acres of cotton production with an annual value of 4.6 to 6.4 million, so an economic value. The same area is estimated to have these large populations of Brazilian free-tailed bats, and they come out of these caves where they roost. And to see the uh, uh, a bunch of bats exit a cave at dusk is a pretty cool sight. Um, they calculated how much each of these uh, Brazilian free-tailed bats eat in, in terms of insects per day is two-thirds of its body weight and then uh, they Cleveland suggested that bats provide an annual benefit of 121,000 to 1,725,000 to that area in pest control so again a predator and prey dynamic which has an economic benefit to um, agriculture. All right, that's 